But this fifth message in the series of hope is called Write It Down. Say, Write It Down. Uh, I love reading biographies. Uh, uh, every month I'll read at least a biography because it stirs me. I always think of the book of Hebrews and it says, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses of those who have gone before us. And it's not only the biblical characters, but it's also people who've gone before us in faith who have stirred us up. And George Mueller was one of these men. George Mueller was a German and uh, not an Englishman. He was a German. And uh, he was good friends with a couple of key players at the same time. He was good friends with a guy called Hudson Taylor who connected together. He was good friends with uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who they connected together, the great preacher in London. And uh, these three guys were all in the same era of time and all doing their things. Hudson Taylor was that infamous missionary to China. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was that great preacher called the Prince of Preachers in London, who died too early, around about 54 years of age. And George Mueller, who outlived two wives, who just kept going and going and going, outlived his children, which is tragic. He was a missionary. He came from Germany to England as a missionary. And he went to a town outside of England called Bristol because he saw the great needs of the children. This is a time when children, uh, there was no protective laws on children. Children were put to work from four years of age. Could you imagine that? They would be in the fields pulling turnips, just like Smith Wigglesworth was. Or they were used as chimney sweepers because they were so small they could push up the chimneys and many of them died uh, because of those areas. And they saw this great move, this great need that was in the city. And it was George Mueller who did this. And in his lifetime, he rescued something like 10,000 children. He said this, if we desire our faith to be strengthened, we should not shrink from opportunities where our faith may be tried. And therefore, through trial, be strengthened. Now listen to this. It's so applicable. If we desire our faith to be strengthened, we should not shrink from opportunities where our faith may be tried and therefore through trial be strengthened. So here's the issue. When we find ourselves being tested, when we find ourselves under trial, when we find ourselves under attack or we find ourselves in a difficult place like perhaps you might feel right now in our nation, it is so easy to withdraw and that's the worst thing you can do. This is a time in which you want your faith to be strengthened and it's trials that strengthen it. Now let me tell you, there's a big difference between the word faith and believe. There's a big difference. Now faith, the word faith is a noun. The word believe is a verb. Hear me? The word faith is a noun. The word believe is a verb. So a noun means the substance. Hebrews 11 verse one says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So faith, you can say, well, you're a man of faith or you're a woman of faith or you're a person of faith. And I, and I appreciate that. But that's just describing, it's a descriptive word. It's, it's a noun. But merely saying you're a person of faith will not make you win. So we see that situation in the book of Mark where we have this father who is overwhelmed with his son being attacked by spirits and he's gone to the disciples and the disciples can't help him and he turns to Jesus and he says, if you can. And Jesus says, if I can. And then he responds, uh, help me in my unbelief. Lord, I believe, but help me. Now the word believe or belief is a verb and verb means active, it's action. So it's not enough to say you have faith because faith is substance. It's who you are. It's a descriptive name. But you've got to believe, and believe is action. It's putting it into area. So you might say, oh, I've come to church today in faith or faith. That's just a descriptive name. That's okay, Hebrews 11, 1. But you need to believe, and believe means I'm stepping out and putting it into action. I'm stepping out, putting it into action. So you can be here today and say, well, pastor, I don't know. I have faith. Well, that's the substance of you. But can you believe? Can you put it into action? See, what we need today is more than you just saying, I have faith. You're going to say, I believe. And when you say, I believe, you say, I'm going to do something because it's the verb. You cannot make a noun a verb. No matter what you want to say in your thinking, you cannot make a noun a verb. It's only the verb that is active in action that does something. It, a noun is descriptive. It's a name. It's descriptive. So I'm glad that we are people of 
faith. That's a descriptive thing. It's a substance of who we are. But to believe is to put it into action. So my question for you today is, it's okay. Your substance tells me you have faith. But do you believe? Because believe is the verb. Believe is the action. Whatever you're facing right now, maybe you're tired from the year. Maybe you want to retreat. Let me tell you something. God never calls you to retreat. He never calls you to give up. He never calls you to throw it in. He never t- calls you to stop. Well, it's the end of the year. I don't want to serve. It's the end of the year. I don't want to do anything. It's the end of the year. Let me tell you something. You might be a person of faith, but you're failing to believe. Because our faith is strengthened by our believing. Our faith is strengthened by our believing. And this is what George Mueller is saying. He says, it's not enough that you have a noun over you, but do you have a verb in you? Do you have a verb in you? I have many different friends of many different areas or acquaintances. And, and one of them from years ago was in our Bible school. And uh, he is a, a Baptist minister. And he's now has a church somewhere in England. And uh, there was a while, a couple of years ago, that he was preaching against me or about me or untowards to me. And uh, someone told me, and you know how God works, uh, the next week I bumped into him at the airport. And I said, oh, I heard you have a lot of love for me. Would you like to get there for coffee? He said he did. And uh, we did. And I said, so what's the problem? He says, there is no problem. I said, then stop saying things. I said, why can't we agree to disagree and still be brothers in the Lord? Because the Bible doesn't say the Baptist shall or the Dunamite shall or, or the Anglican shall. It says those who believe shall. Anyhow, I'm friends with him now and we're doing good, okay? But fact is, is that uh, on his, um, and I appreciate him, okay? And he had on his Facebook page, and he was making a statement, he says, I'm a cessationist. And, and I feel sorry for my Baptist friends when they say they're cessationists because a sensationist is someone who believes that the gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the tongues, miracles stopped. Now, here's a debate. They'll take a scripture from Corinthians that says, and when the perfect has come, these things will cease. They'll take the perfect as meaning when the canonization of the scripture happened. But in my interpretation, in my scripture, the perfect is when Christ returns, because when Christ returns, we'll no longer need to talk in part. We'll be complete with him. Not only is he sensationist, but as Baptists can be, he's also a dispensationalist, meaning that uh, uh, we're now in a church age and Israel's age is over. I don't believe in the period times. I believe in a common thread that began in the garden that goes all the way through to today that the Lord is reconciling man unto him. So I don't care if you're in an Israel time or a church time or pre acts or Davidic or Moses or anything else. The common thread is not you because it's not about you, sunshine. It's about him and he's reconciling man unto him. So I believe there's a role for Israel. I believe there's a role for us and there's a role for the Davidic. There's a role for whatever. He's calling us to reconcile, be right with him because it's the heart of a father, not the heart of a religion. Because we're so strong in religion, we miss the heart of the father. Someone had a bumper sticker and said, God didn't send anyone to hell. He just respected their choice. Because the greatest gift God gives you is the freedom to choose. No, Pastor, the greatest gift is the cross. No, the cross has power when you choose it. The greatest gift God gives you, happy birthday, Yasmin, okay? The greatest gift God gives you is the freedom to choose. You see, the greatest example that God gives us is God as God as the Father. That's why he says in Matthew 7, it says, if a son asks for bread, would he give him a stone? If he asks for fish, would he give him a snake? He says, well, how much more does your heavenly father love you? The very idea that somehow God is looking to beat you up or looking to damn you or curse you or put disease on you is contrary to my understanding of a father. He gives a perfect example of the prodigal son who wanted to go do his own thing. Was the father happy? No, but he had to let him go in his choice. But he was always there for him. He wasn't interfering in his life. He let him have the freedom to choose and the consequences We have helicopter parents. We have attack helicopter parents. You know what the difference is between a helicopter parent and attack helicopter parent? Well, a helicopter parent is always hovering over the child. Oh, you okay? Did you bruise your knee? Uh." And a helicopter parent is like, who's there? I'm going to wipe out whoever that person is. Look out for the teachers and youth pastors and everything else. They're attack helicopters. They're the Apache helicopter parents. Rather than the bell. How do you react when life seems to crash in on you? 
Well, I want you to react by believing. Not merely say faith, because faith is a noun, but by believing, which is a verb. It's not enough to say, I have faith. It's a descriptive noun. But it's as that father says, help me in my unbelief. Let my actions speak more than just who I am. Let my actions speak more. You see, we all have default responses. And by a default response, I mean this. There are things we run to for comfort when we feel we're under attack or we need relief or to escape. To some, it's food. For others, it might be drugs, it might be partying, it might be TV, it might be just doing nothing and killing time, it might be playing on your phone, what a plague those things are right now. It might be the tablets, Uh, I don't mean the top ones, but I mean, you know, those things. It could be your computer. But whatever it is, there are means of escape that often makes things worse. Not dealing with something doesn't mean you're winning. Avoidance doesn't always mean you're victorious. In fact, in our mentoring program, and those of you who want to be a part of my Max Man again, we just started last week. It's um, Thursdays at six thirty. See me or Tony. But we said this: often silence is cowardly. For most of us, trying to avoid a situation or looking elsewhere for comfort makes matters worse. We end up even more frustrated because nothing changes. We may even feel guilty for not being strong enough to deal with whatever the fawn is that's gotten under our skin. But ultimately, we run even further away from the only one who can truly help us. That's the Lord. It's not enough that you're a people of faith. You've got to believe. And by believe means you have to put it into action. And until we are willing to have that honest conversation with God, then we continue with a wrestling match. You know, the word Habakkuk, uh, it means to embrace and to wrestle. So when we think of the prophet, the minor prophet Habakkuk, his very name means to wrestle and to embrace. Uh, He embraced God as his God, but he wrestled with how God was leading him. The very name Israel, Jacob, was changed to Israel. It means to contend with. To contend with. Two fighters will contend with each other. It was Jacob, which meant a snare or a trap. It was changed to Israel, means to contend, because that's where Jacob had this wrestling with God or the Son of God. As a result, he got a dislocated hip. And for the rest of the children of Israel's time, they wouldn't eat that particular part of an animal because it remembered them of the patriarch Jacob slash Israel. It's okay to wrestle with God. It's not okay to wrestle with each other. We wrestle with God. We wrestle with God. There are times when you don't understand what's happening. Perhaps right now you're in a place or a situation where you feel pressured. Yes, you have the substance of faith, but you have the failure of no action. And therefore, when you have no action, which strengthens your faith, your faith goes down. What do you need to do? Maybe you need to wrestle with God. Maybe you need to say, well, Lord, right now I need to be a Habakkuk. I need to embrace you, but also wrestle with the idea of the things you are doing. Uh, Maybe I need to be an Israel. I far prefer to be an Israel than the Jacob who would snatch the heel. And by by, by Israel, it would mean I will contend with you, Lord. I believe in you. You are my Lord. But I'm going to hold on to you until you bless me. I will hold on to you until you bless me. It doesn't say I'll run from you because I didn't get a blessing. It doesn't say I'll make excuses. It says I will hold on to you until the day breaks. I will hold on to you until you bless me. And to bless means to set apart. We want to be set apart. We will wrestle with you because we realize we didn't do it. It might mean that you have a limp. It might mean that your identity is changed like Jacob the Israel. But I tell you what, I'd far prefer to walk with a limp and have a name change and to have peace than to walk well, keep my name, and know no peace. You have to go beyond the substance of who you say you are and come into an action, which is a verb, that says, this is what I am doing. And Habakkuk helps guide us through the valley with three specific actions when you read the book of Habakkuk. First of all, Habakkuk questioned the apparent injustice of God. Have you ever felt God, it seems unjust? 
God, life seems unfair. For those of you who haven't been here, Habakkuk is a minor prophet over Judah. Minor only means in content of material, not in purpose of life. And he can see his land is totally ungodly. The godly King Josiah has been killed on battle. His son has come in and his son does not act in a godly way. The sexual perversion, the criminality of finances, the injustice of the law courts, the immorality hanging around, this came down from the top all the way through. And Habakkuk, this prophet of God, says, Lord, there is an injustice in our land. How can you remain silent? Do something. So God speaks to Habakkuk and said, I will do something. I'm going to get them on the straight. Habakkuk says, great. How are you going to do it? Well, I'm going to bring in an army from another land. They're not believers. It's a land called Babylon. And Babylon is Iraq today. Israel is Israel. It's like a thousand kilometers. He says, I'm going to bring in this army. And I'm going to bring them in and they're going to rout you. They're going to deal with you. In fact, they're going to wreck your world under a king called Nebuchadnezzar who thinks he's a god. So the next minute, Habakkuk is really angry and he goes, how can you do this to your people? See, one minute he's saying that God's people aren't really God's people, but then when they've been attacked, he says, these are God's people. How can you use the injustice of the world? You say, well, isn't it how we live today? Well, I don't live under an old covenant. I live under a new Well, what about what people do? Well, God's a judge. He didn't tell me to be God. Well, someone needs to let me get right. Sure, but ultimately conviction is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a convictor. Well, who are you meant to be like? I'm meant to be like Jesus. And what's he? And this time it's a period of grace. Look, this is gonna sound a bit weird and I might upset you, but I, I pray that you can just rise bigger. I far prefer people who are in sin to come to church than not go to church. Now, I know that you mightn't like that sometimes because you think that we all got to be clean. But, you know, as Moses said, and as Paul reiterated, if you want a clean barn, you can't have an ox because there's going to be poop somewhere. Hello. That's the Bible, Old and New Testament. If you want a clean barn, you better not have an ox. If you want a perfect church, it better be empty. And everybody went, moo, Okay. I prefer someone who's in sin to come to church than not be in church. Now, I know that will irritate certain ones, but it's not because I would condone or support what they do, but because I hope that through the Word and through your love and through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they would get saved. Whereas the church has said, well, if you don't measure up, don't come in. But the fact of the matter is, is that God wants us to move in another dimension, a new understanding, and to understand what he's all about. So Habakkuk questions the imperative influence of God, number one, and decided to stop and listen to God. So here's the thing. When you feel things aren't going the way you want, the most important thing that Habakkuk teaches us is stop and listen. See, sometimes there's so much this, not enough this. Two ears, one mouth. We should listen twice as much as we speak. The second thing is this. Habakkuk took notes. In Habakkuk 2.2, the Lord says to Habakkuk, write down the vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. Why? Well, first of all, he is the prophet, so he wants to show them word for word what God told him, and he wants it recorded for history. If I have a regret in my ministry life, I have a regret. Believe it, I do have one. And... My regret is I haven't journaled. Because when I think back of all the miracles from the conception of this church in our living room to the first building on North Road in whatever area that is, then to the other building, which was in Underwood, and the other half of the building Underwood, and then here, and then buying and then doing it, I regret all the little miracles that I haven't journaled. Because I'd like to think that if not my son, then my grandson or whoever else maybe one day would read those things when they feel discouraged or despaired and they would remember how God moved. Because when you write something down, it's not merely for your memory, but it's for others to receive. 
Perhaps it's not too late. But the fact of the matter is, he said to write it down. The third thing I learned from Habakkuk is this, which could be the hardest action of all. Habakkuk needed to wait on the Lord's timing. Remember, and I talk about time, and you've heard me say this many, many times. I've talked about Kronos versus Kairos, which is Greek, not Hebrew, but Kronos versus Kairos. Kronos, C-H-R-O-N-O-S, is literal time, the time it is. And Kairos means a moment in time, a moment in time. We have to wait on the moment in time. Saul became impatient with Samuel, and he said the time was late. He was thinking of Greek chronos means literal time, seven days, literal time. But rather what Saul, Samuel said to Saul was there would be the right moment in the time in which God would move. And because Saul preempted it, he lost the blessing. I wonder how many times we lose the blessing because in our mind, when God says, I'm going to move, we take that as literal chronos, not kairos. So some of you are frustrated or, 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 or losing hope, losing faith, the substance, because there is no action. And you lose faith, which is the substance, because of a lack of action. When you pull back because you're discouraged and when you start giving up, what really happens is your substance of faith goes down. Because the way to keep it up and to keep it growing is action. It is belief. To believe is action. Faith is the substance of who you are. And that's why Christians who had a faith level here now have a faith level here. The substance of who you are. You want to know why? Because you withdrew. Why? You were hurt. You were disappointed. You were discouraged. You're going through things. But you stopped believing. And believing is the action. Believing is the action. You cannot make a noun a verb. Habakkuk had to trust that God knew the best time to lead his people back to the mountaintop. And when Habakkuk wrote down his conversation with God, including God's promises to deliver his people by first allowing them to be trounced by the Babylonians, he was creating a public record. You say, why would God want him to do that? Why would God want him to record the tragic things that would happen? By having the words written down, God was ensuring that future generations, including his own, would see his promises fulfilled. That's why the Bible says we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. What does the word witness mean in Greek? What does the word witness mean? Martyr. Be careful when you say, I want to be his witness. That means I want to be his martyr. Well, how do I relate to that, Pastor? It means I, I got to go get killed by a sword. Well, Galatians 2.20, for I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So if I said to you, I want you to be his witness, you're saying, well, it means you want me to be a martyr. Yes, that means I want to die. See, we always try to read spiritual things physically because that's our limit. That's our mentality. You see, that's what was wrong with the old covenant when Jesus says, you heard it said, but I tell you. You heard it said, but I tell you. And that's why today many of us are more comfortable with the old than the new. Now, the old has great value because we need that, but we still try to live in it. We keep playing in the old. Well, this is God's judgment. Well, this is going to be here. This is going to happen here. Oh, God. Let me tell you something. The old was written in part, not in full. The new was written in full because of the revelation of Jesus. And you have to understand the truth of the word rather than just a part of the word. The New Testament does not extinguish the old, it brings the old to life, meaning we've got the complete part now. We had a missing part like a jigsaw, but now we have the whole part. So when, it's, when I say to you, you need to be his witness, I'm not asking you to go out there and get killed. I'm asking you to die to yourself. Galatians 2.20 says, for I have been crucified with Christ. Hello, Paul says this. For it is no longer I who live, but what? But Christ who lives in me. The problem is we want to give ourselves to Jesus, but we don't want to die for Jesus. And we say, I want to be his witness. No, you don't. No, you don't. You want to have your foot in two worlds. Well, why can't you do something? Well, because I'm hurt or I'm upset or I'm offended. I'm Look, that's because you haven't died. That's a sure sign. When someone says to me, blah, 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 what they're really saying is I don't want to be his witness. I don't want to die. I'm not asking you to die physically. I'm talking spiritually. Do you understand that? Please tell me you understand that. Basically, God says to Habakkuk, write it down so that when I prove myself just and true, everyone can remember that I am the God of my word. When God says something to you, write it down. Journal it. 
Because your spiritual enemy is an expert at stealing the seeds of truth that God wants to plant. The enemy will try and steal the seed. He will try and steal the seed. And if he can steal the seed, he will stop you from nurturing it and getting the benefits of it. See, God may show you something, and if you don't write it down or make some kind of record so that you can refer back to it, it's easy to forget what he showed you. Writing it down is like a spiritual anchor. When you record it, it's locked down. It's holding you in place. Reminds me of the scripture in Hebrews 4.12, right? It says, hope is an anchor for the soul. That's our emotions. It holds us firmly and securely in place. Sorry, Hebrews 6.12. It holds us firmly and securely in place. You know, the soul is your emotions. You know why we're so up and down of our emotions? Because we haven't learned how to anchor it. And I tell you, when you journal and you do the area there, God's promises, it acts as an anchor that says, no, don't move. Get back here. Temper, get down. Pity, get down. Jealousy, get down. I'm anchoring you in. Better than that, it's a reference point you can return to. And it doesn't depend on your mood or what you have to eat or what someone says the night before. Because as you develop the discipline of writing down what God shows you and what you're praying about, you might be shocked over a few years by seeing how God is and has moved in your life. Go back to George Mueller, 1805 to 1898. He outlived his children. He outlived two wives. George Mueller was a well-known evangelist who lived in the 1800s. And one day his heart broke when he saw hundreds of homeless children fending for themselves on the streets of Bristol in England. With almost no money to his name, he decided to start an orphanage. And over the next 60 years, Mr. Mueller helped care for more than 10,000 orphans. And all throughout his ministry, he kept the record of the prayers in a journal that ultimately filled more than 3,000 pages. For example, in his own handwriting, he wrote, one night there was no food to give to the children for the next morning at breakfast. So he says he begged God to do something. He didn't have food bank. He didn't have a politician. He had no one. Remember, the laws allowed child labor. In the 1800s, they estimate that 89% of the British Parliament were continuously drunk on gin. Not my words. Historical. Early the next morning, a local baker knocked on the door. When George Mueller opened the door, the baker told them that he hadn't been able to sleep the night and he'd gotten up and baked three batches of bread which he had brought to them. Another time he wrote in his own handwriting, he said, a milk truck... By a truck, I mean a horse and cart, not a truck. A milk cart just happened to break down, the wheel came off, in front of the orphanage on the exact day they had no milk for the children. The milkman said, since the milk would have spoiled in the heat, the driver said, I might as well give it to you and the orphans. All in all, George Mueller recorded more than 30,000 direct answers to his prayer. So many other things I can share, but it's another day. More than 30,000 direct answers. Now, we wouldn't know that today, except he wrote it down. I kicked myself because the amount of things that God has done in my life isn't properly recorded. Just imagine how this built faith, not only in him and his boys, but for us today. How many people are moved when they read about the stories of George Mueller? That God's faithfulness was laid out before him again and again and again and just plain black and white. Now, journaling is a challenge. Writing down what you think God is telling you, you know, is that you will grow in discernment. God wants us to grow in discernment, and writing it down helps us. But without going to all the details about how you can learn to listen when God is speaking to you, let me remind you of three things. And uh, if Andreas and that would come up here for me. First, remember that God speaks to each of us in different ways, He does not speak to us all the same ways. Now, it's very rare that it's an audible voice that says, hello. That's very rare. Usually, it's a gentle whisper that wells up inside you, the voice of his Holy Spirit speaking to you. 
But he also speaks to you through people. It could be the pastor, a parent, a close friend. God can also use circumstances to guide you, to slow you, or to reflect to you his plans. And of course, God speaks to us through his word, convicting us, guiding us, comforting us. But the key is, as I shared in Habakkuk, the third one, you have to stop and listen. You have to stop and listen. You have to wait. You have to tune out the distractions. Turn off your phone. Get alone in a quiet spot. Listen. And listening to God requires us to hear from him. Write it down. See, God might be showing you something right now. Write it down. The second thing I learned here is this. Godly, God always normally provides confirmation. God always gets confirmation. When I have an idea or I think a God thing, then the first rule of play is I normally will go to my wife and another pastor, either in the church or outside the church. I do one to two, and I see how they feel. My wife, because she's close to me, and a pastor normally around or outside because they're not connected directly. So what do you think of this idea? Then if I've gone from myself to a group of two or three, I then go to a team group that I would go to. And I go, well, what do you think here? And it might be a group of five to 10. And when I go to them, then I enlarge that to a group of about 40 or 50. And then I'll make it a general statement. See, here's the thing. There's always confirmation. The problem is when you think, well, that's just me and you're running on your own. Someone came to me uh, before Christmas and they wanted to see me and they came to see me and, and they said, we just want to tell you God said. I said, okay. So is there anything you want to say? I said, what can I say? God said. You didn't ask me to check it. You didn't ask me to, to, to talk to you about it. You didn't ask me to interact with you. You could have said, this is what I'm feeling, but you said, God said. So now you live with what God said. If God said it. So here's the problem. We always want to be right. We always want to be matter of fact. And this wrecks us. It wrecks us so many times. The third thing is this. The messages we receive from God will always reflect His character. And if I said you will always reflect His character, it would mean this. It will be measured by the Word. If you ask me, what's the biggest difference from, say, uh, evangelicals to the Spirit-filled? By evangelicals, I'm talking more about your Baptists, of Church of Christ, uh, so forth, versus spirit-filled Pentecostal. Well, first of all, being Pentecostal, spirit-filled, is we are a lot more in tune to spirit things, to hearing God speak or spiritual areas. Let me tell you what our weakness is. We don't know the Word. I, I, I know people right now are in groups that are all talking about being spiritual and they're pre praying and they're fasting and they're, they're doing all sorts of things and saying revelations, but they don't have a knowledge of the Word. And they get these thoughts or these ideas and they run with it, but they don't have the knowledge of the Word and they end up causing more damage than good. There's so many of them around. What's the problem with evangelicals? Okay, is that they're cessationists. They don't believe in the prophetic word anymore. They don't believe in the tongues and the spirit. So they believe in the word. So you have the word. The word is the word, but it's dry. Because see, the spirit is the oil in the word. It's, it's like putty. It, you know, uh, if, if, if I remember, oh, I needed it for six months, Gabby, so I'm certainly not a painter. So please bear with me by using an illustration that comes no comparison to a lifetime. But I can remember when I, we were painting, you know, and I remember, because I was the runt, I had to paint all the skirting, I had to paint, I had to plug all the skirting with the um, putty. I had to sweep it and then putty it, prepare it. And I remember that what happened sometimes on the day before, the putty had gone dry because I had to put it back in, the oil and everything else. And so I learned that if I put that putty in my hand and applied oil and gently worked it and applied more oil and more oil, it became moist. If I didn't, it just broke up, crumbled and like burned away. But I applied oil and I applied oil and I applied oil. In a matter of minutes, literally minutes, I now had putty that was alive again to go work in the area. See, that's what happens when you just have the Word. It's the Word. No one's just saying it's not the Word, but there's no life in it. Which is worse. In some ways, I think we're worse as Pentecostals. Because the ones of the Word, well, they're a bit crusty and dry and a bit belligerent. 
But we at Pentecostals, we're so caught up in the wacky mode, we go around saying things and doing things that make us look like an absolute, well, another name for a donkey, okay? And uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, King James says that word, but you know, I'll just refrain from it. But I mean, that's what happens. I'm embarrassed by many people who claim to be spirit-filled because of the stupidity of their statements and their actions without it being measured up to the Word. I'll say, how long have you been in prayer? I've been in prayer for three weeks fasting. Really? And how much of the Bible you read? Well, you know, I read my daily devotions. I said, you know, well, you're not, okay? You're not, and you're leading people. You see, friends, there's this balance we need to do. We've got to stop judging other groups saying they're not spiritual, and we've got to be open to what we're doing. And this is how the balance comes in. There's nothing too low for the enemy. And the enemy will look to counterfeit. The enemy will look to confuse. And the enemy will look to tell us something just to get our itchy ears to hear. But the interesting thing is this, unless you learn to balance it through revelation of the Word that has to be checked by the Word, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. If I could get people to spend as much time reading the Word as I do speaking in tongues and and getting prophetic dreams, we would have a pretty good move going on. When you write down what God tells you, you can use it not only as an anchor, but also as a litmus test. And every time you refer to it, you can compare it with what you see happening around you. I'm finishing now, literally. Be patient. Be consistent. Two words. Be patient. Be consistent. While you're waiting, stop being don't not be consistent. The problem is we're waiting and we stop our consistency. We stop being reliable. It's amazing how many Christians that as it came into Christmas, all of a sudden decided they were no longer going to be reliable. Thank God for the few, I call them the remnant, who say, well, we'll stand up, Pastor. But it's amazing, how, what, what happened? Well, I'm waiting. So let me get it right. While you're waiting, you're no longer consistent. That's how it works now. While I'm waiting, I'm no longer consistent. While I say I have faith, I no longer believe. Well, I believe. No, if there's no action, there's no believing. Faith is a substance. It's who you are or who you claim to be. It's a substance. Look it up. That's what it says as a noun. It's a substance. Now, faith is a substance of things hopeful. But to believe is action. I believe. I mean, I put it into work. I act. I act, I act. You sow, you reap. I sow, you reap. We want to reap without sowing. Be patient, be consistent. It may take years before what you want comes to pass. But I know this, if God makes you a promise, if God makes you a promise, it will happen. It's merely kairos. It'll be a moment in time that you have no control over. It will happen. It will happen. If He gives you a promise, it will happen. Can you say amen to me on that? Church, I want you to leave today being encouraged. I want you to leave today feeling hope. I want you to leave today knowing that our God is an awesome God, a mighty God, a God is able to meet you in your moment and time of need. But you have to go beyond the noun and get into the verb. Remember, a noun can never, ever, ever be a verb. Never. You can say you're a person of faith and I love that and I support that. That's your substance. That's a title. That's that's describing you. But until you bring in where you believe, which is the verb of action, it's not.